here we go. Here we go with cognition part three. We're going to talk about how language and thinking interact and, you know, what the result is and the terms associated with that. So the first term that we're looking at here is called linguistic determinism. Linguistic determinism. And linguistic determinism is by this guy named Worf. You should probably know that name. Worf linguistic determinism. And basically, it says hypothesis, right? This isn't proven. This is just a best guess um, that language determines thinking. Um, so the type of, if your language has particular words for a particular thing, you're able to think in that way is kind of the idea. So a, a very classic example is that the um, native people uh, living in Alaska, they have many different names for snow. Right? They have different names for the different types of snow because they live in the snow all the time. Whereas if you're speaking English, you basically got snow. You might have wet snow, you might have a little bit of big snow, whatever, but you basically got snow. And that's it. And so when we see snow, we think of snow in one way. Just it's snow. It's all the same. Whereas they think about it in many different ways and more nuanced ways. Another example might be... Um, like in Latin America, in Brazil, there's a word called, um, or a term, a colloquialism. They're called cultural or uh, linguistic colloquialisms. And they're terms that can't, that are unique to the language. that don't really necessarily mean what they say. Um, and you can't necessarily translate all of these things into different languages, maybe into English. So there's a term called simpatico or, and antipatico, right? And you can't, really, you can't really translate these words into English. I mean, simpatico is kind of like easygoing, nice, mellow, uh, loving, life-loving. Um, but you can't, it's, it's not, that's not a perfect translation of what it actually means. What somebody, when somebody says that in Brazil, it means, you know, something more than what you can describe in English. And so you, since you can think and you can't, it, since you can't say the word in that particular language, you can't necessarily think in that particular language, right? So like something doesn't exist. For instance, another example is that, the Hopi Indians, um, where I actually used to live, on the Hopi Indian Reservation, they don't have a past tense. Like, there's not a past tense. You can't say, hey, I ran five miles today. There's no, I ran. Ran doesn't exist. There's no, I shopped at the store yesterday. I mean, there's no ED, there's nothing. There's no past tense. I mean, it's hard for people who speak English in most languages to think about that, but there's no such thing as the past tense. And so it's kind of hard, uh, relatively speaking, to think about in the past, right? Because they're, they're talking about the moment and living in the moment, and that's how they live their lives. So that's, that's this idea of linguistic determinism. Um, it's just basically this idea. There's also, it's a hypothesis, like, like I mentioned. It's not proven. There's actually some um, studies and some people who are cr criticizing this. And uh, like right now, um, it's actually current research as I'm, as I'm speaking about this um, and kind of criticizing this, but you know, it's the it's got the most historical support behind it, um, but we'll see, you know, time will tell whether or not it uh, hangs in there. All right, the next two words kind of go together, detonation and connotation. Detonation and connotation. Denotation, sorry, and connotation. So denotation is the, like, the dictionary definition of the words, like exactly, explicitly what it means. And the connotation is like the secondary meaning or like what it's emotional meaning or contextual meaning is. So, for instance, uh, like here in California, if I say, hey, you got a new pair of kicks. Uh, if, I, if I'm talking about kicks um, and you're not from California, I don't know if they use this in other parts of the country, but kids at, around where I'm at say this. Um, you are talking about shoes, right? You're talking about a new pair of shoes. And... If somebody who doesn't, uh, you know, so when we, th when we think about kicks, we're thinking about shoes, and that's, that would be the connotation here. And so, you know, it influences what we're thinking about, depending on how, what, what we mean by the word. And so the connotation is the, like, more um, secondary, the more contextual meaning of what we're talking about here. All right, the next thing we need to talk about is how language influences um, how we think in that if I tell you that these three colors here are green, like this is green yellow, and this is green something and green something, you know, you've seen that, or yellow green, you know, you've seen your crayons, and I tell you these are blue something, like this is blue, light blue, 
and this is you know like uh, aqua blue or I'm making all this up it's probably not um, whatever if, if when we actually look at this all of these are exactly like the same difference between colors between them so like if you're using uh, some computer program you might say I'm gonna increase the yellowness of it by 0.2 or whatever this is 0.2 this is 0.2 they're all the same difference in, in changing of color but what you would notice here is that these two right here seem more different would seem more different to you if I just showed you maybe if I didn't even show them on this um, you, if I just showed you these two I told you this is green blue and this is blue and then I showed you these two you'd say these two show look more different because they have different names and so the the name the language influences how we think about it if that makes sense and then if I showed you so let me just make sure we understand that if I showed you separately a picture of this and a, or a picture of this you would say oh they look pretty close because this would be green how, how different does green yellow and green aqua look or whatever and how different does aqua blue and sky blue or whatever look and you say, okay, they look such and such, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how different are they? And you might say, you know, three. Well, if I said, if I showed you another picture and said, look at these, how different is green blue from this? Almost everybody in, in research has shown is going to say a bigger difference between these because the names are different. So nothing's, the, the physical differences between the two are different. I could show you all these colors and the differences between them, but the, the name difference is going to cause you to think that there's a bigger difference between the colors. So the language is influencing how you think. Another example of, you know, language influencing how you think, if two cities are perceived to be in different countries or different states if you're in the United States, they're perceived to be farther away from each other than they actually are because they're, you know, the language of where they're at changes. So here in California, right uh, we have a huge state, so everything, you know, we drive seven hours uh, to go somewhere and it doesn't necessarily seem like that long of a distance, whereas if you're in, on the East Coast in the New England area, you might drive seven hours and go across ten states and you don't, um, it seems much farther, like you've traveled much farther because you're going so much farther, you know, different, changing through all these different states, the language is changing as you, as you move. So our language influences how we think in that way as well. We can also think in pictures, thinking in images. So we, might, we can think with not using the language of words, but like the language of images. And so I have a couple pictures here, right? This is uh, Lolo Jones, um, former Olympian hurdler. I don't know if she's going to try again in the next rounds, but... Uh, and this is a former president, um, Harry H. Truman. Oh, I'm sorry, Harry S. Truman. And both of these things, I, I put these on there because if you think about the, you know, going through the hurdle race, I coached the hurdles. If you think about going through the hurdles and visualize going through it, you're actually able to maintain some of your ability just by thinking about it because you're thinking about it through, through the images. And you can also practice the piano just by thinking about it. Now, does that mean you have to, you, you're going to be just as good as all you do is think about the piano? No. Does that mean that you're going to be just as good at hurdling as all you do is think about hurdling? No. But you're able to maintain it for a bit, and, and if you're able to think about it in images, you know, it's able to transfer. Kind of the idea here in all that we're saying here is that thinking, you know, leads to language, and language leads to, you know, it affects how we think. So thinking affects our language and the language affects our things. And so the basic, you know, the gist of this whole, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so that I've just been talking is this idea here that how we think can affect how, what our language is, right? If we, if how we're thinking about this, if we're thinking about it in pictures, you know, that's going to affect our, our language. Our language is going to change, you know, pictures and whatnot. And then what, what we say, like the warps linguistic determinism can affect our thinking. So there we go. That's uh, thinking and cognition. Peace out.